We're just at 10 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's a frigid January um, day, 11 degrees, I think, when I left the house. And um, I'll end on this note, but just a huge shout out to everyone on the IENR team who uh, braves the cold, the snow, the weather to uh, keep our operations going. And I'll, I'll finish on that note. First all hands of 2023, and I hear a feedback from somewhere, which is kind of thanks. Thanks for knocking that off. I don't want to listen to this guy. <laughs> so um, thinking about INR, it's hard not to think about the state of Nebraska and thinking on a cold day about spring around the corner. Our discovery and our research mission, right? Every day wake up thinking about all three of our mission areas. No question about that. We have amazing people, faculty, leading uh, teams of investigators, innovating new solutions, advancing our science, taking that information and extending that information to learners uh, through Nebraska Extension, um, whether they're uh, these kind of learners or maybe a little older. And then to our students, our amazing students here in Kasner in the College of Education and Human Sciences and uh, over in Curtis at NCTA. And then uh, this was a neat shot um, that Craig took at graduation. It's interesting how the learners that were once students then cycle back to be the teachers and the facilitators of those change makers as Tiffany always likes to, to refer to. And just thinking about the comprehensive nature of what we do in IENR as we think about the 150th anniversary of the college and um, thinking also about the 50th anniversary of IENR and we seen these two things together and if you're a history buff you can dive into the history but uh, 150 years ago the college was started um, I spend a lot of time if you were at the Ag Builders of Nebraska meeting uh, the panel, I was on a panel with President Carter and Lisa Lunds asked, uh, what books have you been reading? And I must have been the boring one because I said, I'm reading the, hundredth cen the century, first century of the College of Agriculture at, at, at UNL. And uh, it's interesting history right from the start. I shared some information with the, the deans over the weekend. Um, good read, especially if you're new to the system. And it's funny how history kind of repeats itself. So um, anyway, we're celebrating uh, this year. I'll talk about this. Um, there's a, kind of this confluence. We were meeting in December and this idea came up. Of course, our end 2025 plan and the tagline where every person and every interaction matters. And that, that is true. And I think we try to embody that uh, in IENR. But we have a new tagline added to this on November 18th. We launched the public uh, capital or comprehensive campaign for the University of Nebraska Foundation and their tagline is only in Nebraska. So the idea that only in Nebraska where every person and every interaction matters with the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources being that connective tissue and I, I like that a lot and as we're going through and celebrating that theme and engaging with our stakeholders, our faculty, students, staff, um, this is this is on on our minds kind of related to that I, I mentioned in September that we would do be engaging in a, a lot more listening I'm heading out across the state this uh, spring once the snow I think will be safe uh, but just before planting we'll be out and about across Nebraska some dates um, like two and a half day trips uh, Jesse and I will be out there. I've invited a number of folks to come and join. We've partnered with Ag Builders. We've part partnered with NASEP. Our engagement zone coordinators will be helping us coordinate. We'll have a visit in every engagement zone. And uh, really is a chance just to visit with folks. Again, kind of going back, you've listened to me um, for seven years. Started seven, year seven, but it was seven years in December where Ron and the team were showing me around Nebraska. We were on Highway 61 just north of, of um, Arthur, the city of Arthur in Arthur County. And, and Ron just had that wise, sage question. We know what our friends like the Buells 
um, think about us. But what do the people that live down that lane think about and know about IENR and all of our parts and pieces? And so ever since then, trying to go to small towns, uh, go to large towns, visit people on their farms, their ranches, their, their banks, um, their school, just to have a chance to hear from them. And so that's what we'll be doing. We'll be doing a similar type of inreach, if you will, or engagement. Had the chance, John invited me uh, a couple weeks ago to go and visit with, um, first celebrate awards in the School of Natural Resources and then visit with the faculty and staff and students. So just really trying to listen and, and thanks if you provided feedback. John got that to me yesterday and I, I read it and I'm digesting it, so thank you. So only in Nebraska, just a little bit about this. Uh, on, in our audience, we have some members of our IENR foundation team. We have um, five amazing directors of development and they're supported by um, an amazing uh, staff member. But I wanted to give you a little bit, uh, you could take a look at this. For some, this may be the first time you're seeing this, only in Nebraska, Campaign for Our Future. Uh, when you put a dollar sign on this, it's three B billion dollars, three billion dollars. And the way these campaigns operate, the universities, all the universities are almost always in some kind of a, they're always in fundraising mode. But then to punctuate that, they have these um, centerpieces uh, called campaigns. And uh, I think this is the third one for the University of Nebraska. And every time they set a target and every time they meet or exceed those targets, and then the next time they set a target, um, and the interesting thing, the annual giving continues. It's kind of like magic. So you set a billion dollar target, then a two billion, now we're at three billion, and then the giving follows that, and all of that then comes right back. I think our book value in the Institute of Ag and Natural Resource, we have an amazing endowment that's around $125 million. That is incredible and it uh, generates interest and then that interest, um, part of that goes back into the principal and grows the principal and part of that comes back to you to run your programs. If you have any questions about the, those dimensions, uh, you can talk with, with Josh Egley. But the campaign has three buckets, if you will. They're down here, a relentless focus on student uh, access and success, so our access mission enhancing our faculty, um, and we worked in the clinical operations. That's becoming more and more important even in IENR as we think about extensions push for uh, health and mental well-being of Nebraskans. And the last one, um, and they're no, in no particular order, transformative research and discovery, which really without that, um, there is, there's not much to, to, to help folks learn about or apply. Current progress, so uh, the way these campaigns work, usually the first three years is kind of what they call the quiet phase. It's kind of the storming, the forming and the storming, and then we get out and, and start raising funds. The three billion, um, the target right now, or the, uh, the, the big, uh, the big um, oh, progress to date, 1.7 billion. So usually you don't announce until you have half of the money in hand because then it makes it a little bit easier. Those of you in the room, I see some nodding heads who are working with donors and, and campaigns, you know how this, this goes. So bring this home a little bit. Um, I should probably back up of the $3 billion, Chancellor Green and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln has half of that. So each chancellor was given, quote unquote, a target based on fundraising history. And likewise, each college and the institute was also then given a, a target. Um, the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources target was $108 million, 108.4, but who's counting? Uh, in addition to that, the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute has a $53 million target, NCTA a $17 million target, and um, am I missing? Yes, one more. It is a special, uh, a special competition was held across the university system to identify big bold ideas and we lucked out um, it was more than luck it was a lot of hard work but Andy Benson here from the Nebraska Food for Health Center and a colleague of his at the Postune Inflammatory Bowel uh, Disorder Center uh, IBDC at the Med Center Peter and Andy 
uh, put forth a really compelling package to take all the work that we're doing right now with plants and uh, how plants feed the gut microbiome in humans and how you can harness the pre and probiotics to actually um, kind of attack if you will, or revert or make healthy people who suffer from inflammatory bowel disorders. They're also thinking about heart health and cognition, but right now the target is on, on um, inflammatory bowel diseases. And so that was cool. We were only one of three in the entire system, and they have a $34 million target. To bring this a little bit closer to home then, uh, each of us, this goes back probably three years and lots of conversations, uh, I was asked to put in $108 million worth of projects. I think my first list was $256 million, to which Josh was like, what's going on? Um, the truth of the matter is we've crept kind of back up there. For NCTA, uh, Kelly uh, Bur uh, Bruns and I put in, uh, I think our target was something like $25 million, and we were told how about five. Um, we got it back to 17. So the cool part of this is that um, I've gave, given you the highest level list. Um, there are some very discrete projects in here and there are some um, like the School of Natural Resources that is a, a bit more encompassing. So things like the Platte Basin Time Lapse, a, a watershed in motion, or the Mesonet that is in the news these days, or um, thinking about water uh, and conservation science. There's uh, a lot going on there and there's work to be done at, at further defining this, but definitely we wanted in this campaign to punctuate uh, the School of Natural Resources. There you go, John's giving me the thumbs up. Um, but quite serious uh, about that. Um, the Angler Entrepreneurship Program, big number there. We've got a pilot program going on um, with, a, with a gift for the next couple of years. Plant growth facilities, it's a $35 million project. About half of that will be fundraised and the other half will, will leverage. So the matching, the power of matching becomes really important. So if we can get donors excited about what we're doing, then we can actually leverage federal and state programs. So that's it. We just met yesterday. Um, Daniel Schockman and Ed Cahoon uh, are uh, riding along with us with the likes of Steven Benzinger and Tom Hogemeyer. We had Don Weeks, uh, all three Emeriti faculty. Um, I had the chance to put together a committee, a campaign committee, and so we thought about people who could help us in these areas. We had a great meeting yesterday. Um, this is in direct response to multiple studies, but most recently in 2019, the ARD a Greenhouse Plant Growth Facilities Committee came together and provided uh, uh, internal and external assessment of our, our spaces, and um, it's time. Um, I'm a little biased being a plant pathologist, but it's time. Uh, it's hard to think about doing cutting edge uh, uh, research related to plants that are going to address the climate change, uh, desertification, uh, drought, um, precision production, uh, in greenhouses that at best may maintain a plus or minus 10 degrees uh, temperature swing, let alone lighting and humidity. We have some great stuff over at the Greenhouse Innovation Center and I'll talk a little bit more about the ARS project that will be expanding that footprint, but it's, it's just time. So um, kind of going down the list, big buckets for both student success and faculty success. The $53 million number in Doherty Water for Food actually includes a lot related to research and to teaching. So faculty and students are in there. Um, some of these other specifics, uh, you, can, you can take a look. And then NCTA, pretty amazing, just uh, excited by this, a donor out of Omaha, of all places, who believes in the codependency of rural and urban platforms, um, provided us with a six million dollar matching grant to, uh, if you've been on NCTA's campus, you've been to the old gymnasium, it's called The Barn. Um, it's a great platform, but um, NCTA uh, needs a bit of an infusion in order for it to realize its mission uh, around student uh, success. 
Well, kind of moving to uh, some, some news. We all heard this news. It became public. I think if you were watching Chancellor Green very closely, he was dropping breadcrumbs along the way. And if you know Ronnie and Jane well, he, they're pretty transparent folks. So he was pretty, pretty, um, pretty good about sharing this. But his official notice came out. Uh, it is, um, we're moving along. Uh, the president has hired a search firm. Uh, AGB is the name of that search firm. Um, it me no surprise, it's the search firm that ran the search for the presidents that he was involved with, so that's who's uh, hired. There are listening sessions. Um, to date, he has not, I don't think he has, maybe you tell me, I didn't see the announcement of the search advisory committee, but he is committed to uh, having a search advisory committee. Uh, just just because people have asked me, I volunteered to serve on that search advisory committee. I uh, told him that leadership continuity right now is critical and that our work in IENR and I hope the gifts that I have still have some, some mileage here. So I'm not interested in that job. Somebody asked me, are you interested? No, thank you for that thought. Um, I, will, I told the president, though, whoever he hires, she, he, they absolutely need to understand natural resources and agriculture and rural people. So we'll see where that goes. Um, to invite you all, you can go to the email or the uh, website that was on that page, or you just Google uh, UNL Chancellor Search. We have an opportunity for faculty, staff, and students to engage with the search firm here on the 9th. So from 1 o'clock to 5, these are the time slots. My hope for all of us, um, these public sessions and then these uh, more targeted sessions, is please be involved and, and let, let the search firm know what you think, who you think, what the attributes of our next chancellor are. Pretty important. So my favorite part always, the amazing people of IENR. Uh, congratulations to our new faculty. Um, we have three pages of new faculty um, that have joined us, all different types of faculty. Um, I, I'd ask you, before I click through the other two slides here, do we have new faculty in the room and would you be willing? That's a high risk. Yep, wave, wave, stand up. Okay, yep, give them a, a big round of applause. And uh, we always have cocoa and cookies, so it's, uh, it's great, but um, go visit. We have uh, some new staff, some new staff uh, that are helping us uh, mentor and advise our students and um, absolutely really important. We have some familiar faces perhaps on, these, uh, on those lists that I flipped through that are changing. Some new leaders. We have folks that are stepping into some leadership roles. Um, Keenan and Lisa have joined Team Kasner. Um, Tom Berkey, pivoted over. Uh, I saw Tom here. Yep, Tom, thank you. Uh, Tom stepped in as interim department head upon Clint Crable's departure, um, and we have uh, launched that search. Uh, Keenan has stepped in to backfill for Tom, and uh, Aaron Blankenship has transitioned out, and that position was recalibrated, and Lisa has taken uh, that role around student success. Uh, Derek McLean, I told Derek we had his big, big picture in September at our all-hands meeting. We'll hear from Derek in a moment as ARD Dean. Mitch Stevenson, we ran a, a process out at the Panhandle. Mitch had been in an interim role as the Associate Director and is now working with John Westra. John, we celebrated in, in September and um, good to see you here. And Rebecca Roston, Rebecca is a distinguished professor. Um, and has stepped in to serve as the Associate Director of the Center for Plant Science Innovation. So really, really excited. And then um, big announcement, uh, Mark Stone um, is the person who is uh, joining us as our next permanent director, He'll, uh, or sorry, Department Head of Biosystems Engineering. Mark takes over from um, uh, David Jones. That'll happen on 1 July. Um, Mark is uh, from Northeast Nebraska, did his undergraduate degree there in BSE and went on PhD and master's and PhD in civil engineering, had some professional engineering time and has been at the University of New Mexico uh, where he's been intimately involved with uh, lots of cool stuff, uh, curriculum, but also in some pretty neat um, indigenous tribal people 
uh, work when it comes to food systems. So we're excited about uh, uh, Mark coming home. I want to just give a shout out, uh, thanks. Uh, Tammy Brown Brandle and Martha Mamo served as co-chairs. Uh, this is a model now that we're using for our department head and school director searches that we borrowed from the ARD Dean search. We're Ed Cahoon and Tiffany Hang Moss, so when we hire somebody, a leader, try to get a leader, a current leader in the same role, and then we also are involving faculty as co-leads, and, and this model, I think, served us well. Um, members of the Search Advisory Committee, some of you that are here, thank you very much. And uh, to our internal candidates, uh, Angie Paneer and Terry Howell, a big thank you for uh, putting yourselves out there. It was a very difficult this decision, I will say that. And thanks to everybody who was involved in that process. John Carroll's in the back of the room, so as we say hi to Mark, we're saying see ya, at least see ya from being the school director. Um, John's not going anywhere, and back to that slide, we're still discussing maybe you know, outside of his uh, passion and love for teaching and learning and engaging in experiential learning platforms in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think that list where we had some fundraising goals, I, I'm looking to bring John in to help us on that. So uh, pretty excited about that. John, can we give John a, a round of applause? Thank you. And then we have um, just an update quick, animal science. You can see uh, we launched that search formally, so that's uh, moving along. Goal is to have that person um, interviews late this spring, somebody identified and have that person here by the start of this, the fall semester. Uh, we are in the forming stages on the um, School of Natural Resource Director. Uh, we've got input from John and uh, others. And Rich and I, this week, will finalize and then get out and make invitations to the Search Advisory Committee. And then Ag Econ. Um, Ag Econ is uh, rebooting, is what I'd say. Uh, we had a national search, had a great candidate. It was a tricky um, position in that it was a dual career path uh, hire. Um, that didn't work out. His school retained him, South Dakota State. We had an, a quiet search brought in some great candidates um, that was a little tricky too a candidate of choice also was a, a dual career hire this time um, in the math department we got all that worked out and uh, the deadline for letting me know was 6 january and she texted me on the 3rd of january and broke the news that she wasn't coming and that she was going to some school in columbus ohio as department chair and that was like <laughs> That was, that really hurt. <laughs> but we, we, have a, we have a colleague from Ohio State who's finishing her PhD who's joining us in Douglas County. So I think we made up for, for one for one transfer. So what are we doing? We're rebooting. Um, I've been working with the faculty in the department right now. Uh, we will need an interim. So the, the faculty, the senior faculty in the department are engaging their colleagues to come up with a path, a path forward. And um, the goal is to get that search. Uh, we're going to recalibrate the position description and the search advisory committee to reflect our contemporary search approach. And then right the week after uh, the end of the spring semester, we're going to go full international search. And uh, we'll see. We're going to need help on that. Every once in a while, this just kind of happens. And I think one of my colleagues in Ag Econ said it the best, you know, the search process or the timeline needs to take whatever that is, Mike, let's not try to, to force this. Okay, so coming up, I'd like to introduce and have Derek McLean, our Dean of Ag Research Division, and Tala Awada, the Associate Dean of ARD, to recognize a couple of our early career faculty award winners. Thanks, Mike. Can everybody hear me? Good morning, everyone. So uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank everyone in INR who's engaged in research. You saw that transformational research and innovation were, were, is one of the pillars for the Only Nebraska Foundation in that campaign. So we uh, really appreciate everybody who's engaged here. And so one of the roles, that, one of the best part of the role of this uh, position that I'm in is to give an award. And so it's a great pleasure for me today to give this award of the ARD Junior Faculty for Excellence in Research Award. And is Justin with us? Yep. Justin? Come on up. So Justin McMeekin 
is one of our awardees, and he's an assistant professor in crop production and cropping systems <laughs> specialist. Congratulations, Justin. I'd like to actually read a couple of <laughs> I'd like to read a couple of uh, a couple of quotes from uh, the nom one of the nomination letters for Justin is that uh, he has included collaborations with plant pathologists, agronomists, weed scientists, plant breeders, other entomologists, extension faculty, growers, and industry collaborators. And he has developed research programs to address emerging issues, providing a rapid response to economically damaging problems identified by growers. And really, you know, he's, what he's doing, you know, the th three criteria for this award are uh, publication record, uh, evidence of external funding, and then also peer recognition. And I think Justin has pulled all three of those together in the early part of his career. So congratulations. And one other thing that every letter and every nominator mentioned about Justin is he brings so much enthusiasm and energy in what he does. So I think that really is a great attribute. And so thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And our second award goes to Rebecca Wax. Is Becky here? Goes by Becky, right? So mm -hmm. Becky is assistant professor in biological systems, systems engineering. Congratulations. <laughs> and again, I want to read a couple quotes. Is that Dr. Wax has developed an ambitious research program to identify the biological targets implicated in orthopedic disease and pain and develop innovative biomaterials and drug delivery systems to address those targets. And this really is an, has high impact for degenerative back pain, so it's really an important area of research. And her research program is developing models and her expertise in designing therapeutic biomaterials to garner an impressive list of external grant funding sources, including NSF and NIH. So one other thing also that, was, that Becky does is provides a lot of service in the community and really gets out and does a lot of activities in that area as well. And I think is a great ambassador for both INR and UNL. So again, let's congratulate Becky on this award. Thanks, Derek. I'd say um, I, remember, I remember Becky Walks sitting right there as a, on the, the first all hands meeting. And um, we started on the same day. So congratulations, Becky. And, Justin, hail no, is uh, probably one of my, hail, H-A-I-L, one of my favorite um, uh, extension programs to see Justin up on a tower at an NREC field day blasting corn and beans with his hail gun. Um, pretty interesting. So thank you and congratulations to everyone. We have a really neat ceremony every fall where we um, recognize new named professors. Uh, those individuals are listed here, and all the named professors uh, are provided with a medallion. Um, it's a nice dinner. The donors who oftentimes make those endowed professorships and chairships available come to the dinner, and uh, it really is a nice celebration. We had it here, and then we catch each of the, the new professors or, or chairs uh, cold by asking them to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what makes it special for them. It's really cool. And then afterward, we take a picture of uh, all the existing chairs, and it's kind of, it's, it's a neat deal. So um, congratulations to this uh, new group and to everyone who's recognized in this way. We have launched, and IANR, I'm proud to say, has been a part of this uh, and a supporter of uh, launching both first in IANR, a staff advisory council, and um, then to be supporting the formation of the UNL Staff Senate. Yep, I see a lot of pride out there in the room. So would those staff senators who are representing our inaugural class, would you please stand so we could recognize you for this service? Yep, don't be shy. That's a big deal and I'm excited. So this will sit parallel of faculty senate and really allow with our student government, our staff shared governance and our faculty governance an opportunity to really elevate issues that are important to staff. Okay, congratulations everybody. Some news, uh, new and noteworthy. 
So I'm going to run through these pretty quick. Uh, I'm on the clock. So we have a new governor. We have a lot of new changes uh, downtown at the Unicameral. New governor. This governor knows us. Uh, he comes from agriculture. He's a veterinarian. He's been a Board of Regent member for the last decade. Uh, hails from Columbus, a graduate of, of um, this institution, and um, now is our governor. So to have somebody who understands agriculture in that seat through and through, he's a business, he and his family operate a, a genetics platform for swine production, it's a big deal. Uh, so he has hit the ground running. He has recalibrated his executive team. We have a new um, director of the Nebraska Department of Agriculture, Sherry Vinton. Sherry and her husband um, are ranchers. And if you know where Whitman is, you, you know where Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory is, there is a road that, and then you know where Arthur is, because I already talked about that, and there's a town called Tryon, right on 90, 92. So 92 and 20 kind of run parallel a little bit, and there's a, a road called Oil Town Road. And it is a one-lane blacktop. It is like spectacular, although I took Josh on it, and I think he was a little nervous because maybe I was driving too fast, but it is beautiful, and the Vinton's Ranch is right there, halfway, halfway on Oil Town Road. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with Sherry and then to continue the partnership with the other uh, directors. Uh, there. Governor Pillen has outlined his um, bold agenda. Um, you know, just in short, he's uh, a fiscal conservative, so we'll talk about that. It has some potential budget implications. Uh, um, Governor Pillen's, uh, Governor Ricketts' baseline was about 3%. Governor Pillen's baseline is 2%. So he's starting even at a lower, lower level, and we have to navigate that. He's Talked a lot about property taxes, and those of you who engage with uh, property owners in Nebraska, especially those that have options of going into South Dakota or Wyoming or Iowa or uh, Missouri or, or Kansas, um, it really is, we're at a competitive disadvantage, and uh, young people who are interested in, in staying here uh, are making choices about where to live in, in part because of property tax. Well, related to property taxes, it ties you right into how you fund PK through 12 public schools. Formula that predates um, me and most of us in the room, kind of a third from sales tax, a third from property tax, and a third from uh, income tax, and that's the way it was supposed to work, but it's pretty lopsided right now on over-dependence on property tax. That has to get adjusted, so Governor Pillen is uh, pledged to do something about that, and that too has implications for higher education. And it also has implications for folks in rural Nebraska who I think for a while have felt that their property tax dollars are being distributed in an uneven way while they believe in the codependency of rural and urban. It just feels a bit imbalanced, and this is something that impacts the College of Education and Human Sciences who is engaged with our 243 school systems, Nebraska Extension, who's engaged with rural communities and, um, and, and the college and NCTA. Amplify Engagement Conference. So I won't, um, won't put them on the spot, but Kathleen Lodel is right over here. And if you are interested in amping up, um, talk with Kathleen. Uh, this is a really, this is the second uh, annual Amplify Conference. Last year we had a great opportunity to showcase what we're doing. This year they've taken on a new twist in partnership with other colleges. We have a huge number of folks coming in from across Nebraska, from greater Nebraska, to campus. And part of their time will be engaging not only with campus-based faculty in IANR, but also with campus-based faculty in other colleges. So we'll be meeting them in their colleges, which is really cool. And if you have any question about that, please reach out to Kathleen. I think there is a huge desire to have as many of us that work on, on the campus to be engaged. And so, you know, please see, please see Kathleen if you have any questions about that. Governor Pillen, I think, is the keynote on this. Um, Governor Pillen also was the keynote at the Ag Builders of Nebraska. Senator Fisher came and President Carter came just to kind of punctuate um, what's going on there. We've had great opportunities for telling stories. Just a huge shout out to KRVN and the Rural Radio Network, but our partners at the Nebraska Public Media, 
um, that allow us to connect into P, uh, uh, platforms like uh, PBS and NPR. And um, this is really cool to hear the stories and I would encourage you to, to go and visit um, these media. Thank you to Kara Peshek, uh, to Jason Cooper, our entire IE and our media team. And uh, it would be remiss if I didn't just uh, say we're all very saddened by um, Dave Fitzsimmons' uh, passing. Yeah, very sad, uh, tragic accident. And uh, he was a colleague for a long time of our IE and our crew. And uh, he passed away. Uh, and that celebration of life was last Sunday. So just uh, keep David and his family uh, in your prayers. Nebraska Sandhills, uh, we have the largest uh, temperate uh, uh, prairie system in, in the world here. And uh, one of four uh, large intact grasslands, each one a little bit different from savannas and so forth. We are celebrating as part of our innovation of celebration there is this cool book called The Atlas of the Sandhills. It's brown and it came out in 1990. Um, very pithy. Uh, I think it was revised in 93, but if you talk to any of the ranchers and folks that call the Sandhills uh, sand home, um, they, they really look to this. It talks about uh, natural resources, everything from fisheries and geologic formations to production ranching to um, the indigenous people that once called and still call uh, Nebraska home. It, um, it was a little bit heavy and we decided to uh, celebrate, so we're redoing it. In fact, it's over at the Nebraska Press uh, going through its final edits and all the artwork being pulled together. It'll be more of a coffee table type book um, and it is uh, really cool. And lots of people co-authored that. Mon Monica Norby um, really was instrumental in helping us move that along as a, a, a passion of hers. It will be coming out this time next year. So I'm excited about that. And um, then the other cool part is going back to uh, Platte Basin time lapse and, and the watershed in motion, we're connecting a lot of multimedia uh, into, um, in fact, they already are, and if you haven't visited that site in a while, it's well beyond Platte Basin time lapse. Pretty cool. But we're connecting a lot of stories in different ways of accessing that to these folks. I had the privilege of writing the foreword for this, and I just kind of, I wish, I wished, uh, I wished as a kid somebody would have sent me a note, a note card or a postcard from Nebraska because I would have been here a lot sooner than, than you know, when I came at, at half a century. Part of the fun on this, and this is part of our fundraising goal, is to um, actually send this out. Send this out to libraries across the country, PK through 12 libraries. So in a way, this becomes a bit of that postcard. Um, every, every one of the schools uh, in uh, school districts will get a copy of it, and we'll celebrate with the, the school districts that call the Sandhills home. Pretty neat. Flatwater Press, I want to, if you haven't seen this article, please take a look. There's been a lot in the news about water quality. Uh, in Nebraska, we take water uh, conservation extremely seriously. Uh, I was just uh, this morning kind of out for my morning walk thinking about all of the parts and pieces of IENR that literally touch water. Uh, everything from our integrated uh, water and integrated cropping system to faculty in the School of Natural Resources, Biological Systems Engineering, Agronomy and Horticulture, Animal Science, Ag Econ, and the list goes on and on. Um, this is a, a wickedly complex issue. The university has a role to play. IANR has a serious role to play in this at uh, convening and bringing expertise, crawl, precision and farms. I mean, you just, you just think about who's connected to this platform. But the NRDs, huge partner of the university, NDEE, NDR, NDA, um, state government needs to be a part of this. Our colleagues in the College of Public Health, um, if we think just about, it's a different um, environmental insult, if you will, and complexity, but what's going on at Mead from Judy Wu Smart looking at honeybees as indicators of environmental health 
to uh, Jesse um, Bell, who's a, a shared dual faculty member between the College of Public Health and the School of Natural Resources. Um, we, have, we have whole teams that are working in this space, and um, it's going to take every one of us. That's, uh, the issue is pretty straightforward, that over time we've pushed yields uh, in corn production in per, uh, particular. Uh, there are some, um, some, uh, some attention that needs to be paid to feedlot operations. All of this, where's, uh, where's Matt Jokel? All of this has to go back to the geology. All of this has to go back to our soil science. So depending on what uh, soil those plants, uh, what soil the animals are, are on, just really thinking about water percolation rates, thinking about um, practices that uh, are applied to our agricultural systems, and then how, uh, how what we apply either is bound up or taken up or as Ron likes to say, gravity will, will pull it down. And so thinking about below the root zone, all the way down to where the aquifer starts and our soils are really, really complicated, especially the soils that were ge uh, glaciated over here in the eastern part of the state, um, northeast in particular. So what happens is the application of, of nitrogen, uh, the plant uses some of it, even with the best precision, even with the best of intentions. We all know what weather is like in Nebraska. Uh, the advent of a center pivot has been really great on water conservation, but that has a dynamic to play. And I won't go too much further on this because it's not my field, but the bottom line issue is that that soil that sits below the root zone, but above the aquifer called the Vados zone, and we have a lot of experts in this room from across the platform that talk and know about this, it's, it's supercharged. It's supercharged with nitrate. And that nitrate gets into the groundwater, and then that is pumped through our rural water systems, and, and then it's ingested. US EPA's target is 10 parts per million. Anything above that is a potentially problem. We have some uh, rural water systems that are pumping, you know, 40, 50, 60 parts per million. So it's a big deal. It's got everyone's attention, okay? So that's the issue. Uh, we've got a lot of people working on this. We've been working on this issue for a long time. Uh, Laura Thompson and our Nebraska on-farm uh, trials, trying to demonstrate solution sets. But human nature is, is tricky, and this is a complex issue. First thing when you're a farmer and you walk into the bank and you're looking for a loan, they look at yield potential. TAPS has been a great opportunity to help us look at profitability but this is gonna take all of us. So, um, as far as timeline and next steps, we are working very hard on a 45 to 60 day uh, dialogue where we invite uh, individuals in and look at what we have already on the table. We're looking at extension publications, we're looking at what they say, we're looking at our partnerships with the d directors of the other state agencies, at convening them, because I think that's what we do, convene, the power to convene, and then uh, our data-driven solution sets. But it's gonna take everyone on the state level, at the unicameral side, they are working very hard, two pieces of legislation to uh, increase the amount of funding for reverse osmosis systems. First and foremost, every Nebraskan deserves fresh water to drink, and so trying to figure out how do we make sure that that happens. The tough part of this is even with the best science and all of us pulling in the same direction, unless somebody magically engineers the, the ability to pump water out, somehow treat it, and mitigate what's in the ground or in those aquifers, is that it took us 50 to 60 years to get into this challenging problem, and it's going to take us 20 to 30, and that's probably optimistic if we're all pulling in the same. But again, what do I want you to hear? We have a plan, and part of that plan is an invitation to every one of you that is listening or everyone in IENR to roll up their sleeves and be a part of that solution set. I don't know all the gory details what that looks like, but what I do know is we won't be as effective if some of us choose to engage and others don't engage. The Bovee Fire. So I want to talk a little bit, our, our friends from Nebraska Forest Service who are listening to us from across, uh, from across Nebraska. Um, fire season, 
fire season, June to September, typically. Well, we've been in like a constant fire season given drought conditions for the last two, two and a half years. And this last year was tough. We had 200,000 acres of land that was uh, impacted by fire last year. Just to kind of bring this home, uh, this campus, a uh, city campus is uh, 275 acres. So that's like 300 city campuses. Uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska is about 70,000 uh, acres. That's three Lincolns. Um, Omaha, 90,000 acres. That's like two Omahas. I don't know about you, but when you land at OMA and you drive home, it just like Omaha goes on and on and on and on. It's a big area and it impacted a lot of people's lives. Um, there were several people who lost their lives fighting the fire, uh, serving their neighbors. It's a problem. Unfortunately, in Halsey or near Halsey at the Halsey National Forest and Grasslands, our 4-H camp that is there, and I say it's technically it's owned by the Nebraska 4-H Foundation, and it sits on, the, on U.S. Uh, Forest Service ground, was uh, caught in the blaze, a complete loss. Um, this is uh, what's left standing of the lodge that's there. We've retrieved some of the, uh, the sentimental memorial pieces that uh, are there, and we're working on uh, trying to figure out what does the community need. Some people say we need a camp. Others say, well, that's where we had our wedding anniversaries, and that's where we celebrated baptisms, and that's where we brought communities together. So on, June, on January 3rd, uh, Kathleen Lodel and Charlie Stolt and I visited with uh, now State Senator Mike Jacobson and Tom Brewer down at the State House, along with Jeff Yost, who's the Executive Director of the Nebraska Community Foundation. And I asked them in 45 days to come forward with a plan that first and foremost engages the people of the Sandhills to figure out what that looks like. Um, Senator Brewer and Senator Jacobson submitted a legislative bill to create um, kind of like the Rails to Trails Park uh, program in Nebraska, um, a legislative bill setting aside 50, 50 million that could be used not only for this camp but for other youth engagement platforms such that people could come with a match and try to leverage that. So stand by, this has got a lot of people's attention and there's a lot of emotion in this and I would say a lot of people are still grieving the loss of a, of a close friend. National Center for Resilient and Regenerative Precision Agriculture. Um, the folks are partners from the USDA ARS lab provided us with an update in September. I'm happy to report that planning continues on this. Uh, this, uh, this, I won't go into details too much, but uh, we're working with HDR, the engineering for firm uh, out of, out of uh, Omaha. It's a USDA project, but we're involved in it. They have the first $20 million of construction money, and that first $20 million will be right behind this inset. You can see some uh, some solar panels on a brick building, that's the head house, and then 15,000 square feet of greenhouse space. Just to give you a sense, the greenhouse innovation platform that where Ileana works uh, and Amy work, um, we have 15,000 square foot of greenhouse and 35,000 square foot of head house. So we're in conversations, real-time conversations, because inflationary cost overruns are pushing this project more to like 28 million not 20, and so I'm trying to help them see how we can leverage our asset and theirs and come up with something that allows this all to keep going. I was in Washington, D.C. last week and had a good visit with the ARS administrator, Simon Liu, kind of walked through and reaffirm our commitment. They're a little, they're a little skittish with Ronnie's announcement, and, and I needed to reaffirm that, you know, we get it, and President Carter's going to make a trip with me just to punctuate that here in, in later March. Tractor Test Lab. Well, I'm talking a little bit about these, and there's one other that I want to throw in here. First, I love that picture. That's very, very cool. Um, but I also wanted to bring up drought, uh, drought resilience, and uh, desertification. I can't say that, Mark Swoboda. Um, but uh, really thinking about weather and climate, and thinking about um, National Drought Mitigation Center, 
uh, thinking about the Mesonet, thinking about the High Plains Climate Center as three platforms, thinking about Crawl Craig, uh, Center for Resilient Agricultural Working Landscapes, thinking about all the work that we have going on um, in climate resiliency. This is uh, these three things, uh, the National Center, uh, thinking about NDMC, and thinking about um, the Tractor Test Lab, and beyond the Tractor Test Lab, our ability to think about digital agriculture and digital platforms. Uh, each of these are the, are the target, if you will, the focus, probably a better word, of our federal engagement strategy for the University of Nebraska. And we have um, uh, money in there, 2.5 million, for example, to be earmarked directly to NDMC, such that NDMC, which supplies the USDA with so much valuable information on so many programs, right now it's kind of a hand-to-mouth existence and discretionary fund pools in Washington. So uh, Senator Fisher and our, our uh, delegation is taking the lead. The tractor test lab picture is really this idea of campus, IENR, and all of our parts and pieces, the currency that we operate in are in ideas and science and innovation. So if we're an idea platform, then how do we take those ideas and how do we develop them into prototypes and how do we take those prototypes out across and figure this out? So in particular, when we're thinking about digital agriculture, it's wonderful but it's also highly susceptible to cyber intrusions. And so we have a 100-year-old, actually what's a 102-year-old tractor test facility that we will be celebrating this summer, its 100th year anniversary. But I think, and so do uh, uh, folks that are close to that, some in this room, that that's an excellent platform to cyber harden um, uh, implements PTOs that are involved in agriculture. And through NREC and the Rogers Memorial Farm, we have this huge opportunity to look at how smart technologies are networked because the other cyber soft spot is don't have to go after shutting down a, a, a combine or a planter or a harvester or a sprayer. You could just go after the nodes that control those things, kind of like a smart house. Um, so. That's just a quick one there um, in helping us advocate at the federal level. Uh, Brad Lubin and one of his graduate students, Tatum Bab Babcock? Brunko. Brunko. Thank you. <laughs> Babcock, Brunko. I'll get it. Tatum. Uh, I asked them in December to help us out. They pulled together economic analysis from the seven states that I don't know what you call us. We're not the Midwest and we're not the, the, where the High Plains meets the Midwest. But the cool part of this, when you look at the impact of these seven states, it's incredible. 60% of the soybeans produced in this country here. 50% uh, over 50, 54% of the corn produced in the United States of America here. You start looking at, at livestock and poultry, uh, the numbers of farms, the, the amount of acreage that's connected to production and feeding that world. So, we are working very hard beyond the Nebraska delegation with our partners in these seven states to really advocate for the why Nebraska, answering that question. We had um, the chance to break ground on the Klosterman Feedlot Innovation Center. Meg's in the room. Um, just a shout out to Meg's family. Uh, Meg's mom and dad, incredible, but for John Klosterman, we wouldn't have an IANR. But for Beth Klosterman, we wouldn't have an NCTA. And uh, through a generous donation gift from their family, um, we were able to name this platform. We broke ground on this in November. Uh, we have one more step in front of the Board of Regents that takes place next week, which allows the contractor to uh, come in and uh, actually get on with this. Pretty cool. Um, innovation and collaboration space. If you go over and grab your ice cream next time, walk down the hallway towards the loading dock. If you've been paying attention as you went to Dinsdale, you noticed that we punched a hole through the wall. Uh, we have created Tammy's like, yeah, let's go, Tammy Middleset. Uh, we have uh, created a food, energy, water, and societal systems engagement hub for our PK through 12 partners. Uh, locally, that PK through 12 partner is Northeast Lincoln High School, the Rockets. They have redone their teachers there, 
have redone their entire curriculum to focus on the things that we care about. We created a space where you come in on the Holdridge side and you exit on the side of the, of the Legacy Plaza and you engage. Uh, that same space will be used for our partnerships in Sutherland, bringing folks from our partnership in Gearing, um, Scotts Bluff, and then the 21 school districts that are part of the Northeast Nebraska Agriculture and Natural Resources Education Compact, that's a mouthful, um, to bring them uh, engaged there. So lots going on, very excited. Lots of other projects, I won't, I won't go through these. Uh, I told Kara, kind of joking, glad that we had $13.8 million for greater Nebraska projects and another nine for projects here on this campus. Those projects have started in earnest. It's a little bit though like a project at your home. I don't know about you, you're so excited to get the, get the project going and day one the contractors show up and by day two you're ready to get them out of your house. Um, I think that's probably how folks at the Elliott Building and at GP VEC um, and at, at North Platte uh, are feeling. Ag Hall is on the list. Uh, we didn't put this on the list. This campus-based list was really driven by our friends in physical facilities. Ag Hall was built in 1905, occupied in 1906. The last attention and love it got to its uh, infrastructure and so forth was 1978. Um, the heating and cooling is not, doesn't work, no surprise. So the residents of Ag Hall will be um, coming to join you in your neighborhoods <laughs> and uh, we'll be moving out the week after uh, after graduation and we don't move back in until like March of the following year. Pray that we move back in in March. So we'll be right there with the folks in the Elliott Building. Discovery Days, we're in year three of the Discovery Days. Excited about this, excited that we're celebrating ASABE's um, uh, an big anniversary here on campus connected with the Tractor Test Lab. I'm really excited. Please mark this down. We have one day in June, one day in July, one Saturday morning, 10 to 2, June, July, and August. It's really picking up steam. It's pretty exciting. And this is just put a big, wow, if this happens, it would be amazing. Yo-Yo Ma, who happens to be coming to the LEAD Center, um, you can Google, Yo-Yo Ma has this uh, program around uh, making his way back to find nature and he is taking his cello and he is showing up in all kinds of cool places, the Grand Canyon, hooking up with local musicians and he's playing his cello inspired by nature and the natural resources that are, are so amazing. So we, Mike Farrell sent me a note in early January and said, hey, look at this. I said, wow, we should get him to come here. So like 15 or 16 of us across all the university and not, we sent him a note. We sent him an invitation. And we sent him an invitation to stick around a couple days or come a little early and get out to the train crust to see the migration of the cranes and bring his cello. Now, we haven't heard yet from him, <laughs> but he is coming to Lincoln, so we'll see what happens. This is just a reach, right? Um, you don't, what do you tell us no, I guess? Okay, a little bit on budget, because uh, words out there. Um, Ted Carter, and if you haven't seen this, I'd ask you to maybe Google, Google this, or we can put this out and, and provide you with the website. But Ted provided just his thoughts on higher education. Um, it's probably not good that we have two Navy people now, because we're dropping Navy terms and lingo, and Ted really is dropping uh, lingo here. So Ted was an uh, aircraft carrier commanding officer after his flying days were off over. And then he, once you become a commanding officer of an aircraft carrier and you're promoted to a one-star admiral, you have what's called a battle group. So 20 ships and submarines. And Ted was a battle group commander for a while. So he knows what he's talking about. But, um, and that's all the Navy I'll talk about, but headwinds. So um, being out there on aircraft carrier, which I had the privilege of serving after 9-11, I was on 11 of our carriers. And um, Ted's absolutely right that um, what's not well known and a bit shocking is that's the fastest ship in the United States Navy. Everybody says it's big and it takes a long time to turn. It actually can turn 180 degrees in three minutes. And uh, when you're on the ship, once you go above 30 knots, 
um, the, speed, the speed that the ship is moving is blacked out so that the sailors don't even know how fast the ships actually go. Why is that important? Because you can't launch planes off the bow of a ship without headwinds. You need the lift, so the carrier makes its own headwinds. But it also has to navigate those headwinds. And uh, the budget situation in higher education, it's pretty tough right now. Um, you can read the article, we've been talking about it. Everyone in the room has been part of our recruiting and retention plan. And I won't steal any of Tiffany and Sue Ellen and the team's thunder and the advisors in the room. All I will say is thank you. Um, you're doing, every day you show up and you're doing the right things to attract and retain our amazing future change makers and, and difference makers and it is paying off. But the number of traditional college age students is dwindling. It's getting smaller. And Nebraska and the High Plains, it's really tightening up. So there are fewer students which make getting them to our universities in this highly competitive nature tricky. Well, add that to COVID, add that to some of the complex um, State Department dynamics with international students, and it's kind of a perfect storm over the last couple of years. Last year, the University of, of, of Nebraska system, for the first time in a long time, fell below 50,000 students. So that's a tricky bit. And it, it hurts that we have, again, a new governor who's fiscally conservative and a unicameral that has 17 new members who happen to be debating the next biennial budget. And we're asking for some money, and they're probably, some of them are head scratchers, like, why do you need more money? You don't have as many students. It's that kind of common sense um, conversation that's taken place. Well, Ted, in this op-ed, and again, I just have you read it, because I'm not going to, he really calls out that things, things can't keep going the way they are in higher education. And he also calls out that things can't keep going the same. Status quo is not going to work here. And um, so I'm sharing that with you. It's a bit ominous, to be honest with you. Ronnie Green, Ronnie in his uh, December 6th all hands meeting to which department heads and school directors attend, along with people like me and the deans. Ronnie was very clear that um, in 2022, when we finished the, the year, Jim, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln was $10.2 $10 million in a structural deficit, primarily due to the lack of, uh, of enrollment dollars, tuition rolling in. I'm here to tell you that in addition to that, so I might as well just jump to that slide. In addition to that, we're 13 million right now in this academic year projected shortfall in revenue. So if we don't or aren't able to handle that through cost containment and belt tightening on, as we switch from fiscal years on June 30th to July 1, that 13 million gets added to that 10.2 and we're looking down, looking down the barrel at a $23.2 million structural deficit. The economists in the room know that that's great. We haven't cut programs. So we still have to come up with the cash to pay for those things when we don't have it. And if we, if we don't see changes in enrollment or we don't see a change in our revenue projection, then this will lead us back into a conversation about serious belt tightening. And, and that's all I really want to leave you with. I don't want you to be surprised that, um, and I want you to know almost weekly, if not twice a week, having meetings after meetings after meetings of figuring out where do we already you know, where do, we, where do we find these resources in a way that doesn't slow down our growth mindset? And unfortunately, I've been saying this to you since 2016, 2017, and I've asked you and you've rogered up, you've responded so well, and regardless of how we manage, and I'm using that word, we will manage and continue to manage our way through these, these headwinds, as the Admiral, as the President calls them but we will maintain our growth mindset. And thank goodness we're an optimistic, positive bunch that, that helps each other out. But I'm here to say that it's gonna be a little choppy and uh, we're watching. I passed over this slide. This is a reconciliation of Governor Pillen's proposed budget to the unicameral. You can see a $2 million increase for the University of Nebraska in our operating budget 
in, in the next fiscal year, 24, 2% 2 in 2025. Those are the two numbers I really want you to look in. If you look below, that's what President Carter and the Board of Regents, uh, that was their starting point, that 3%. So that's a big difference in a state, state uh, appropriation that's about 675 million. You can do the math, uh, it adds up pretty quick. So I think what we're a bit in a watch and see with what the unicameral is doing, the minute that the unicameral makes their decision, then President Carter and the Board of Regents need to have a big conversation about tuition and fees and what happens there. I guess I'm here to say that even if we get 3% and even if we were to increase tuition a significant amount, and I'm say that by like 2 to 3% would be my guess, that's still not gonna, that's still not gonna get us out of the structural deficit that the campus or the system are facing. And that just is old fashioned. Everybody together have difficult discussions and try to figure out what are those, what are those, uh, what's the best of the not so good options to pull to move us forward and keep us moving. Okay, that's all I wanna say about that. And then at this time of the year, um, I think a lot about you know life and and rejuvenation, and this is a, a picture from this calving season. Um, I was getting all kinds of calving season pictures, calving pictures this last weekend, so people have started. Um, twins, I've seen several pictures of twins, pretty cool. Uh, so I'm sharing that just as kind of a, a ray of hope and optimism, but I also wanna show this from the Sandhills and just say thanks. You know, I called the team up at Goodmanson Sandhills Ranch couple days before um, Christmas and just said, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm cozy in my home in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, the team is out there in 22 inches of snow and 50 mile an hour winds trying to take care of the cattle. Uh, the generator that we so proactively purchased hadn't gotten installed. They lost power. And so I think they really appreciated that, you know, we, we remind, we, we remember them. And again, everybody's job in IENR is really important, but there are some that um, go above and beyond every day. In, uh, and we do it in different ways. And I just want to make a, sure that the staff across IENR, and I guess I'll look at the camera, um, from NREC all the way over to Mitchell, uh, to Goodmanson, and everywhere in between, just thanks, because without, Without you, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So I think with that, um, we have plenty of time for uh, questions, about uh, eight after. Um, we'll open it up for questions and happy to take them. We have a microphone that's roving and I've um, given some of the leadership team the uh, heads up that I may just ask you to address that, that response, right? Thanks for your attention, yeah. Questions? Thoughts, comments? Meg's waving, Brian, no question. We also have the opportunity if you have questions and you want to email Kara, uh, just to kind of front load this, there was a question. One of the things that Chancellor Green said at his December 6th all hands meeting, um, how he's thinking about this uh, reduction in administration. We have about the big number, about $32 million worth of A-line positions at the University of Nebraska. Uh, 32 million out of 1.4 billion, that's the budget for UNL. And the chancellor has been on that um, line for a while. If you remember back to 2021 with COVID induced, we reduced our administrative uh, uh, team in Ag Hall by 10%. So the Chancellor's calling for something akin to a 15%, at least asking us to think about that. Um, another area he mentioned was perhaps VSIP, and this is one of the questions that rolled in prior to, hey, I heard the Chancellor talk about VSIPs. Um, I think the Chancellor, uh, I'll be very candid with you, that was a surprise to the Vice Chancellor when he said that they were considering, or he was. He asked uh, Kathy Ankerson, the EVC, to take a look. She's done the math and the math really doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't jive. I told the, the chancellor my two cents that I'm, um, I'd be good with VSIPs, but I think it needs to be a college by college decision, personally. We have some colleges who are so thin in the uh, full professor ranks that it's hard to staff a, a P&T committee. 
Um, we're losing a lot of, of talent um, through the VSIPs. Um, in IANR, I can tell you we're not in a strategic decision to, to even consider that. I think it's dead. So if somebody's waiting for a VSIP before making a decision, don't take it to the bank, but I think it's a low probability event. So that was one. There was another question that came in prior to uh, asking about calendar changes. Uh, during COVID, we uh, changed our calendar. I think we all know that. Uh, we have now this January term uh, that happened on Elizabeth Spiller's watch. That came in part because of COVID and re-entry concerns, but it also came out of a call from the chancellors and the president that we had five campuses of the UNL or NU system, and each campus was on its own slightly different schedule. And by adopting this J term, um, which was to provide students with an in-depth opportunity to explore an issue and pick up a course that they really needed to accelerate their uh, graduation timeline, it was also an attempt to get everybody on the same calendar. Um, my sense is that for the next two years, we're on the same calendar. I think uh, last year we didn't have a full week of spring break. That got fixed because people wanted a week off in the fall and a week off in spring. So um, that's happening. The other thing I would say about the calendar is that there is a Pan University calendar committee made up of faculty, staff, and administration and students and they have been the ones really recommending things to the chancellors and the presidents. So the president and the chancellors. So those were two questions that came in. Other questions? I'm not gonna hold you here. We have cookies and cocoa. You've got things to do. Okay, with that then, um, you've got questions, you know where to find me. Thank you very much for everything you do every day and uh, stay warm out there. <laughs>